uh, Tom, uh, I understand in 1957 you introduced uh, an eight-track multi-track recorder, which was quite revolutionary to the uh, uh, the uh, stable of gear at uh, Atlantic. Uh, yeah. Was that a custom machine, or uh, did you design it? Or no, no. Uh, I had heard. I see. I, I had some idols, though it was not the kind of records that we were making. We were making jazz and gospel and blues records. Uh, I fell in love with some of the records that Les Paul was making. Uh, I knew how Bobby Fine had done some of the Patti Page records because I shared the studio with him. And I knew I was witness to what he was doing. And I thought, hey, that's pretty slick. But, but you could tell the difference between the first and the second and the third generation. Right. I was listening to the Les Paul stuff, and I was thinking, what is he up to? How does he get away with that? He's playing four guitar parts. His wife is singing three parts. Like, what? Of how? Did, how do they come with this? And I it's can't two understand. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's distracting me. I got wind that he was working on an eight-track machine, so I immediately supposed that, that a son of a gun, he's found a way because I had been working stereo since 1952. Sure, but. Multi-track beyond that was unheard of, and engineers were raining at the, 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 the there's too much signal to noise, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, the, when I got wind of Les Paul with the eight-track machine, uh, one or two of the people in Atlantic said, hey, you know, like, uh, d would it help us? And I say, well, the only thing it could do, it would afford us a way that we could mix the records better to make them louder, because loud records were vital. Right. Uh, Tom, we're gonna we're running a little short here on time, and I'm, I'm gonna accelerate things a little bit. bit. Uh, I wish we had time to go over all these mm. uh, uh, important points in your career development. Uh, but I also see that in uh, uh, in the '60s, uh, you are we're moving into the '60s now. Uh, Memphis, Muscle Shoals, and so on and so forth uh, come to mind, and I'm wondering what it was like to work with those great rhythm sections that existed down there. Uh, they were an, an absolute pleasure to work with, and, I, and the, the fun that I had with them was that, for the most part, those people expected me to come in with a magic wand and do some engineering magic. And along with being able to change the way they recorded, I could communicate with them musically right. and gain their confidence that way. And all of a sudden, it was a whole new dialogue. I mean. I was updating them engineering-wise because in the 50s they were still recording on disc or still using radio consoles where we were using new state-of-the-art equipment and I was helping them get into that. Uh, did you ever work with the uh, Dixie Flyers also, another oh, yeah. section? No, we, we, as a fact, the Dixie Flyers was a uh, uh, put together that uh, Jerry Wexler wanted a Memphis-type rhythm section here in Miami because we kept on going to Muscle Shoals in Miami. He says, airfare, we could pay for a rhythm section down here for a year. And so he put together this accumulation of musicians that we'd all worked with at one time or another in Memphis, mm -hmm. the Dixie Flyers. I see. Uh, now we're going to take a whirlwind uh, jump or a quantum leap uh, into the 70s now. And I see that you were moving around uh, in a lot of uh, places and you were asked to go hither and yon by many uh, different labels. I assume you were still with Atlantic, is that correct at that time? By, by the end of 1968-69, Atlantic was part of the Warner Communications complex. And that was an umbrella so that I was subject to being yinged and yanged into anywhere in the Warner complex. That's why I was doing Rod Stewart for Warners and somebody for Electra and somebody for Reprise. I mean, it was yin and yang. Well, Tom, we're going to move quickly again. We're, we're now in your fifth ga death gate, which is 1980. And I see that you uh, were doing uh, a lot of work where you were uh, uh, being asked to come in and uh, try to help labels uh, or, or uh, a project that was in possibly in trouble. Uh, was that because the labels didn't know what to do with a particular artist, or is it because they were over budget? Or Well, there, it adds up to this. With my years of experience and the reputation I had from the engineering aspect and from the uh, artist and taste aspect, uh, if, if, an if a record company and an artist were at odds, the record company could trust me not to sell them down the river, and the artist could sell, trust me not to compromise their artistic endeavor. Yeah. And so I was used to settle a lot of those issues by people who'd say, we haven't got anybody here that can do it. Get him. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. Tom, we're going to bring you up to the 90s now. This year, yeah. sixth decade, which you, uh, you're in now. And we know that the Allman Brothers are one of your pet projects and have been for years, and they're still unseen. Uh, are you still producing them? Or? Oh, yes. Uh, there are only two, perhaps three albums that the Allman Brothers have done that I haven't produced from 1969, 1970 until now. 
Uh, we have one coming this year. We're working on it now. We're picking songs and starting rehearsal. Are they doing the same type of material or are they changing their material or? Uh, this time there will probably be an instrumental, which is something we have omitted the last two albums, a new instrumental. Uh, we will not rely strictly on vocals. But you know what? If we've got seven or eight good vocals, the instrumental will get pushed out of the way. I'll be honest with you. I, it's, there is no allegiance to anything they do. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us on our series on the music industry.